I made a video in 2020 titled, The M109R is the worst motorcycle I've ever owned. Well, I'm here to tell you now that I guess it's time for me to eat some of those words. Since I've owned the M109R, I've done the simple work up to the more difficult work, like changing out the oil. Of course, that's easy. Then the radiator fluids, then completely overhauling my braking system. Then came valve clearance jobs and fork seals and clutches. And here I am now dealing with the fuel system. All of that is routine maintenance, but now I'm starting to ask myself, have I not learned my lesson about working on my own motorcycle, especially this one? When I made the video, the M109R is the worst bike I've ever owned, <laughs> that was about the transmission issues that these bikes have. And I bought one that had that problem. It wasn't this one, but it involves spending $2,500 to fix it. And at the time I didn't have that money, nor did I have the know-how to fix it myself. Looking back on that, many people weren't too happy about what I said, and they had a complete disregard of the root problem that affected a bunch of unsuspecting people that bought in 109 rs with this problem. I stand behind everything that I said in that video, and still, what many people believe is that these bikes had a manufacturing defect for an issue that probably should have been recalled. The transmissions in the early years on the 109s, they were weak, and eventually those components were upgraded. You got people today that are buying older 109s and unfortunately some of them are having that thousands of dollars to fix transmission issue. And as wonderful as these bikes are to ride, to own and see on the street, the truth is they had weak transmissions in the early years. So what if I had that problem today on my 109? I hope it never happens, but part of me believes that I could at least dissect the motor enough to get to the gearing to at least save myself on some labor. Because just like most liquid cool motors, the gearbox is in the engine casing, meaning you have to crack the case open and get it, take everything apart essentially to get to the gearing. But the beautiful thing about this bike is you shouldn't have a problem finding parts. Suzuki started producing the M109R in 2005, and it is still available for purchase brand new despite having any major changes. And there was a small visual refresh in the styling in 2010, and then Suzuki introduced the Boss versions in 2014 going forward. This is pretty much their blacked out version, right? But outside of refining the motor, making, I guess, bad components better, like the transmission, all M109Rs are essentially the same, other than, I guess, color and whether or not they have chrome or black. I've always been vocal about wanting to see a new 109, not necessarily from a visual perspective, but I also want to see more power. Also, more technology like ABS and traction control, maybe variable valve timing, and also saving weight. If you don't know, this bike weighs almost 800 pounds. It is not a light bike, but I can tell you that experience riding this bike has prepared me to ride many other bikes out there. But we know Suzuki has the capability, but other than emission standards, I would like to think that the 109 and the technology that's in this bike, Suzuki is basically gotten their money back from the R&D because they made the same bike for 15 years. What sparked my initial comments about wanting a new 109 is from riding newer machines like the Ducati X Diablo, newer Indian motorcycles like Chief and Challenger, having unfiltered access to the new Rocket 3, and also owning, personally, a V-Rod Muscle. All of these machines, except the Challenger, being much lighter in comparison. Those are just my own thoughts, and of course you got people out there that think this bike is perfect the way it is and that Suzuki doesn't really have to make a new 109. They can just keep making the same bike over and over and over again and just changing the paint. That's it. But you can look at it like this also. If it's still selling, why would you change it, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Again, this bike has been the same for about 15 years and it still puts out respectable power numbers. It pumps out like 125 horsepower and around 120 pound-feet of torque to the crank and it just has a very distinct look to it going down the highway. Like when you see one, you know that's a 109. Granted, the look grows on you. I didn't really like it at first, but I love the look of this bike now. And it just has that muscle bike feel. It's just beefy, it's just over the top. It just has a very aggressive stance similar to that of the Rocket 3. This checks off on the list of every single thing that a muscle bike or power cruiser should be. This is the epitome of a muscle bike. And then of course I bought my V-Rod Muscle because I wanted more. And I know these bikes aren't the fastest muscle bikes, right? You got V-Max and other bikes, but these are really great power cruiser muscle bikes. When I bought the V-Rod Muscle, it messed up my mind even more and just put me in a weird place, <laughs> you know, on which one I like more and just riding muscle bikes. I just fell in love with them even more. 
But the difference between these two bikes now is that this bike was produced for 18 years and it's discontinued now. And this bike was produced so far for 15 years and it's still in production. And I made comments about Victory Motorcycle and how parts for that motorcycle might be difficult to find in several years once Polaris has stopped support. Definitely check that video out if you have not already. I'll leave a link at the top right. I don't think I'll ever have an issue trying to find parts for this motorcycle. It has 15 years and counting worth of new and used parts. And I can say the same thing about the V-Rod Muscle. Harley Davidson, again, it produces motorcycle for 18 years. And if tomorrow Harley Davidson decided to stop support for the V-Rod Muscle, I am very confident that the aftermarket would step in and fill in that void. If you didn't know, the global support for V-Rod is insane. There should be no problems finding parts for that bike. And not to say the same thing about the, the M109R as well. Here's another example. This is my 2009 Pontiac G8 GXP. Looking at it now, it's very dirty. There's snow flurries out in the air, it's raining, and I need to wax it again. But I do daily drive this car. It is, it is not a garage queen but it is also one of 1,829 G8s ever produced in this spec in the entire world. And it has a naturally aspirated V8 pushing 415 horsepower and 415 pound-feet of torque to the crank. I love the way that this car looks and it is a wonderful car to drive. So being that this car shares components from other GM models, I can take an LS3 motor or a 6L80E transmission out of another car or truck because a lot of these cars from GM use the same components and I can drop it straight into this car and of course suspension at the market but the problem is is finding body work and trim pieces and covers and those rims those rims are one of a kind you're not going to find those rims new anymore and you're not going to find them used i guess you could take some off of the chevy ss but if you want to keep the original stock wheels you're going to have a you're going to have a problem finding them so now that i again daily drive this car my thought process is, was is if this if something ever happens to to this car in that perspective God forbid it's in an accident, I'm gonna have trouble fixing it unless I have, I guess, a bottomless pit of money to take it to a custom shop and have them fix it for me. So I come back to the 109, remembering that I wish it had more versus looking at the success this bike already is. It's fairly okay to work on, it's mostly reliable, and if something were to break, crack, fall off, whatever, I could easily at this time buy the component and replace it or easily go out to eBay and find a used one. If it's something that needs to be painted, it can be addressed at some point too, right? The beauty in that is that will be the case for this motorcycle for a very long time. And that mindset has changed my perspective on motorcycles in general. And I look at this now as it's not the worst motorcycle I've ever owned, even if it had a transmission issue. It's more probably the best motorcycle I've ever owned to date. And as I continue to work on this bike and take stuff off, break stuff, learn how pieces connect, changing old components out like the, the, the rubber brake lines and changing it to steel braid it, right? My experience with this bike will only get better, even if I have issues with it. Like I'm dealing with the fuel problems now. I'm not upset that I'm dealing with it. I'm kind of excited that, that I'm, I'm able to work on this thing. And again, the experience will only get better and this bike will continue to age like a fine wine. And the same thing will go for the V-Rod. My future purchases of motorcycles will be centered around the idea of having access to both new and used parts because I don't want a project just sitting in here for eternity because I, I can't find the parts to fix it. And at some point that may change, but that's my current mindset now. I like having access to what I need to get this done. And as I get more experience under my belt, I may take on that 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 old bike project that nobody's heard of in a long time and I just decided to figure it out and uh, see if I can get it back going. But right now that is not where I'm that's not where I'm at. I'd love to know what you guys think. So comment down below about your favorite motorcycle or your favorite car and uh, I guess some of the things that you went through with it. And uh, let me know why is it your favorite. But as always thank you for listening to my story and also listening to my love for the 109. But Hey, if you want your opinion to be heard, definitely give this video a thumbs up. And if you're subscribed, I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.